Hi there. What do you think? Am I as scary as this fellow? I'm here at the Akron Art Museum, and this sculpture is called Howling Faces by Antoine Burdell. You can almost hear him howling, can't you? You can see that the faces are not exactly representational. I mean, the features are distorted, making them even more frightening. These are creatures of myth and legend. They originate in the imagination, not the real world. You've probably seen faces like this at the movies, particularly horror or science fiction films. They aren't monsters exactly, but they certainly aren't real people either. For centuries, mythical beasts and people have fascinated artists. Many old, old churches and cathedrals include figures of imaginary creatures called gargoyles. Some works of imagination can be scary, like these. Others can be funny or whimsical. Artists who don't want to be limited by the real world let their imaginations soar and shape sculptures like these. The museum has a special interest in contemporary art like this. Let's take a look at the works of Joseph Blue Sky and Donna Webb of Akron, Ohio. You'll see the resemblance between my howling buddies here and what they create. Donna makes small pots and Joseph creates figures around them. And what figures? I sculpt the figure. I work with my wife Donna who makes the pottery that you see here. And I'm the fellow that does the the sculpting of these uh, characters. I think I'm going to have a figure holding this pot up on his shoulder. And uh, what we have, we just start with a blob of clay and start making uh, a torso, some arms on it. And uh, Part of the process is seeing what my hands moving the clay will give me. Sometimes you get little gestural marks on the clay that you like, and you don't, you don't want to just keep patting it until it's smooth because the little uh, marks and folds in the clay often suggest part of the sculpture. So you're really collaborating with a lump of clay while you're doing this. As you see, we've got something of a figure happening here. Neck, shoulders, arms. This pot, I think, could be right up here. I've moved his shoulder around because I like the way that looks a little better. In this process, it's just about pinching and pulling and, and working this clay until it starts to look like something that I want it to look like. Sometimes I begin with an idea and it changes completely because the movement of the clay suggests something that, that I like better than my original idea. There's a lot of a lot of things that we like to call happy accidents that occur during the making of something where uh, something droops or sags and all of a sudden you see a little bit of a different uh, gesture than you did in the beginning and you may or may not like that gesture better than your original gesture. You don't think these things up necessarily and then go according to plan, you have an idea oftentimes, and then the process of making the thing helps with the, uh, with the effort itself. And I've got a kind of an interesting gesture. Now I want to think about a little bit more detail, uh, because now, of course, he is pretty undefined. What I'm interested in is a tool that has a, a point for detail work. What I want to do here is put a couple of details in with this tool, uh, which is basically kind of like drawing in the clay. And this is not the finished look, but it's beginning to define the figure a little more so that I can uh, begin to see where I need to stop. I'm beginning to see here that I want something for hair up here. So I'm 
I want to do something different with his head. That's a little more interesting. I'm going to turn him around and take a look at the back side because I haven't done anything much to the back side. No definition, no muscles, nothing that indicates much of a figure. So I'm going to put something in there. I'm going to fill in that hole. And as I work this clay in, I try to get it fairly well worked in, not to smooth it, but rather to join it to the rest of the clay so that in the frying process it doesn't simply pop off, which it can do if it's not well joined. Now, in terms of anatomy, this is pretty simple. I like simple things. But that's kind of a shoulder blade there. It's going that way. This one, because the shoulder is up here, a little different position. This shoulder blade is going to be more like that. This one like that. Outward, this one up. They move like this, like the wings of a, of a bird. All right, I think we've got him far enough along for the present. I'm going to set him aside to dry out a little bit. These pieces, when you make something uh, this way, you want it to dry slowly so that in the drying process it doesn't crack and, uh, and start to split apart. In this case, uh, the little pot that Donna made for this figure that I uh, was working on uh, is thin, as you can see. Whereas the figure is quite thick and large, now he's a little firmer uh, today, so we're going to move on to the hollowing out process. Uh, for that, we have this tool here called a ribbon tool. We'll just start to take some material out with this tool. What we want to do this for, again, to ensure that the piece is relatively similar in thickness all over uh, because of that problem of drying. We don't want to get so far into there that we push our tool right out of one of these shoulders or something and deform the piece. We get a lot of our ideas uh, from myths and legends and things of that nature, fairy tales and whatnot, stories that we both like. And uh, from there, we sort of uh, use uh, each other to bounce ideas off of by uh, she'll make something or start something, and I'll take it a little further, and uh, then I'll give it back to her to, uh, to do something else with. And, and oftentimes, the, a piece of sculpture or pottery sort of becomes uh, what it's going to be through the process of our switching back and forth uh, for different processes. The students at Walls Elementary School let their imagination soar while shaping their clay sculptures. When you start to work with a piece of clay, when you're making a figure, Joe Blue Sky talks about the gestures of the clay and keeping it rough at first. So as you start to work with it, you don't want to do any smoothing or fine tuning right away. You want to start working with this stuff. You know, you start out with an idea like maybe we've got a guy here. Maybe we've got a figure or a form. And as you start working with it, you say, well, gee, do I want him sitting? Do I want him kneeling? And you start working around with it. Once you get this figure roughed in like this, if this is a seated figure, the plasticity of clay will let you take more, blend it in. You just use your fingertips like this and move the clay around. It's not going to dry out. You can work with it. You turn it different ways to see what's going on with it. You know, a little bit too much here. These ribbon tools you can take a whole chunk off like this, and then where you need it, put them back in, like this. It's additive, it's subtractive. You can work with this stuff. These are getting a little bigger, but uh, if anybody feels slighted, they know where to get the, the basic point of the piece. 
to do. Don't be, if someone's struggling, if you see a friend struggling, don't be afraid to lend a hand. Looks like she's pouring. Oh, maybe you can she get is. like water. Clay water? Oh, I can get clay. Like watery. It twines. So oftentimes a brow ridge is going to be a little bit more pronounced out here. And then you might even want to take, I mean, I know you've got clay in your hands, but feel your cheekbones and think about even constructing stuff like that. So work a little on that, those features before it gets to And the hair is beautiful, really nice. And as I look at Hannah's, she's got some hands. We know they're hands just by the gesture and the shape. But, uh, you know, she doesn't have to put in every fingernail. Eventually, you're going to start to detail these up a little bit. But you might want to leave a little bit of a rough texture on the surface if, uh, if that helps. And just jiggle the mouse whenever you need to see Zeus, okay? He's got his hand up. Maybe we should just leave this up, and I can move some stuff. You could actually sit here and work here for a little bit. You want to? But I'd like you to hollow these out from the inside so they can dry kind of uniformly. Work on the bisque-fired pieces. Let's come on up and get some colors going, people. Is it like a bright yellow green? Go ahead and use something like that. This has a green and a yellow. Sure. Don't mix up the glazes because they don't mix like regular tempera glaze or color glaze. You mix up a yellow and a red together and you think, oh, it's going to make orange? Not necessarily. So use them separately. Keep the colors that way. If you want to get a color that's more or less a tan like my skin color now, what I'd like you to do, use a little of the medium brown, put a coat on, let it dry. Go over it with um, a little bit of this stuff, sun yellow or even a white. Now this is an underglaze, it's all standard glaze, all silicate glaze. I think you're going to have a lot of luck with it. students did a lot of improvising while they worked. Sometimes the finished sculptures turned out completely different than how they had planned. Many artists find that what may be a mistake is really, as Joseph calls it, a happy accident. Working with clay allows you to think with your fingers, almost as if they had a mind of their own, which is handy when your model is a figment of your imagination. Teaching materials for sharing art are available on the web at wneo.org slash sharing art. Funding for this series was provided by the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation and Northeastern Ohio Education Association. NEOEA's members include elementary and secondary teachers, university professors, and support professionals proudly serving students attending the public schools and colleges of Northeastern Ohio.